Many marine invertebrates have one or two larval stages in their life cycles. Larvae are different in morphology and often in habitat than juveniles and adults. In this video, we'll look at a few of these, like these villager larvae of an epistobrant gastropod. There are lots of ways to categorize larvae and larval life cycles. One major way is by whether or not larvae need to feed in the plankton, and we'll definitely pay attention to that. Another is by where development happens. In many species, like in these expertly drawn sea urchins, adults broadcast spawn their gametes into the plankton, where fertilization and all of embryonic and larval development happen. Eventually, the larvae metamorphose and settle back to the seafloor. We can call those fully planktonic larval life cycles. In other species, all of larval development happens on the seafloor, in an egg mass or an egg capsule, or on or inside a parent. The larval stage is passed in one of those protective structures, then metamorphosis happens and a juvenile exits the protective structure. We can call those aplanktonic life cycles. And many invertebrates have an intermediate life history where fertilization and early development happen on the seafloor in a mass, a capsule, or the parent, but then a larva exits and spends some amount of time in the plankton. We can call those mixed life histories. First, let's look at some larvae I obtained directly from their parents. Since I can usually identify adults, I know the identity of these larvae. Here's an adult calcareous sponge, Leucoselenia. It broods its larvae in the spongiceal, and you can see that eventually they swim out of the parent. They're non-feeding, and they probably have a very short planktonic period of a few hours or days. Here's another example of mixed development. The Scyphozoan aurelia broods embryos in its oral arms, then releases them as non-feeding planula larvae. You can also remove them from the oral arms artificially, of course, with a pipette. Here is an adult of the annelid worm, Hydroides gracilis. This is a broadcast spawner. In lab, you can artificially induce adults to release gametes by breaking their tubes. Here's a female releasing eggs. And here's a male releasing sperm. These embryos develop into tiny, swimming and feeding trochophore larvae. In this side view, you can see the mouth, pharynx, stomach. The stomach is quite brown, full of partly digested algal cells, and then the intestine leading to the anus. The larva swims using prototrochal cilia. Posterior to the prototroch, you can also see cilia of the metatroch, which are also used in feeding. You can see prototrochal and metatrochal cilia a bit better in this older larva, especially at higher magnification. This larva has three segments that have chidae already. 
you can see those three pairs of kitty better in dorsal view. When larvae of this type of annelid, serpulids, have three segments, they are usually ready to metamorphose. Six days after fertilization, I offer these a nice muscle shell, and some immediately metamorphosed. First, they build themselves a transparent mucus tube to hold them to the shell. They then start to add calcium carbonate to the anterior end of that tube. This animal has a small white patch of calcium carbonate at the anterior end of its tube, you can see it moving its kitty as it adds more calcium carbonate to the tube. Here's that same individual a day later. The old mucus tube is still present, but it's hard to see since it's transparent. The larva has built all this new calcium carbonate tube in the past 24 hours. You can also see that the feeding tentacles have developed on the prostomium. This juvenile is now feeding and is done with metamorphosis. I found a nice gastropod egg mass on the hydrozoan Aglaophenia on a dock in Alaminos Bay. The egg mass is that bright white structure. It's a ribbon of gel that the snail has deposited. If you look at it closely, you can see lots of embryos embedded in that gel. When I collected some of the hydrozoan, I found out who deposited that egg mass. It was the Epistobranch dodo lancii, a small nudibranch. This species feeds on Agliophenia. Look just behind the head on the right side of the animal, you can see a little bump. That's the penis, I think. Remember, all epistobranchs are hermaphrodites, so this individual both produces and receives sperm. The embryos in that egg mass were already early villagers. Though adults of this species are slugs, that is, they don't have a shell, larvae have shells. They're a little hard to see since they're transparent, but you can tell they have them because the larval shell is strongly birefringent when you look at it in cross-polarized light. After holding this egg mass in seawater for a day, planktonic villagers hatched out. Here's one of those villagers. You can see two velar lobes, the stomach with a few algal cells in it, and a few other structures. Most of what's in the shell is digestive system. Just behind the velar lobes, you can see two spherical structures. Those are statocysts that help the villager figure out which way is up. These use the prototrochal and metatrochal cilia to feed, just like the larva of hydroides that we looked at. It's hard to visualize particle capture in this view, but you can easily see captured particles being transported to the mouth in the food groove, then swallowed. That's even easier to see if you slow down the footage.
Captured particles are held in the esophagus for a little bit before being passed into the stomach. And eventually, of course, indigestible material has to be eliminated by defecation. That fecal pellet is passing through the rectum to the larva's mantle cavity and then to the outside world. Here's a species with fully planktonic development, the sand dollar Dendraster eccentricus. This species we can induce to spawn by injection of potassium chloride. Here's a male. And here's a female releasing eggs. After early development, these form pluteus larvae. At three days after fertilization, the pluteae have only four arms. This pluteus is in side view with the anterior end to the right, posterior to the left, dorsal to the top of the screen, and ventral to the bottom of the screen. In this view, you can see the esophagus, which leads into a large pink compartment, the stomach, that leads to a smaller pink compartment on the ventral surface, the intestine, and that leads to the anus. After another week or so, the larva has added four more arms for a total of eight and has also grown in size. If you look at the posterior end to the right, you can see an orange region and next to it a yellowish region. The orange region is the stomach, but the yellowish region is the developing juvenile sand dollar. At higher magnification, you can see that the developing juvenile has numerous little hollow bulbs in it. Those are the tips of the juvenile's first tube feet. At metamorphosis, that juvenile will resorb the larval tissue and crawl away as a juvenile sand dollar. Here's the tip of a larval arm showing the ciliary band that these larvae use to swim and to feed. These larvae capture particles primarily by localized reversal of these cilia. You can see the paths of captured particles if you look at free swimming larvae. These are all swimming up, with the, so with the tips of the arms towards the camera. Of course, it's easier to see particle capture if the footage is slowed down a bit. Another way to look at a diversity of larvae is to capture them directly from the plankton. It's a lot more difficult to identify larvae captured in this way though, since there are no good guides to identify larvae for most regions of the world, including Southern California. 
I captured some larvae for this video using net with a mesh size of 100 micrometers towed off of a dock at the mouth of Alamitos Bay. Here's what that concentrated plankton looked like at low magnification. Pretty sure that the large orange larva at the top of the screen is that of the bryozoan water cipra. At higher magnification, you can see all kinds of life in here. Most of it isn't larvae, though. Most of it is adult copepods or other crustaceans, or large single-celled protists like tintinid ciliates. But there are larvae here, and I picked out a few of them to look at more closely. Here, for example, is a Mueller's larva of a polyclad flatworm. It's almost a millimeter in length, which is pretty big for a larva. I think that this is a feeding larva, but I am not sure about that. There are lots of annelid larvae in our local plankton. Here's a late stage larva of a spionid annelid. In addition to the anterior prototroch, you can see another ring of cilia that it uses for swimming at the posterior end. That's called a telotroch. And here's another annelid, what I think is a capitellid, though it could be a member of a closely related group. This is a feeding larva. It also has a telotroch. And here's another capitellid larva, but that of another species. This species has non-feeding larvae. The spheres in its digestive system are lipid droplets that the mother had placed in the egg. This larva also has a telotroch. And one more annelid larva, that of a nephtid. This is ready to metamorphose. You can see that it has lots of segments, parapodia, and chidae. I didn't see many mollusk larvae in the plankton toad, just a few bivalve villagers. Here they are, both in side view. The hinge on this individual faces the bottom of the screen.
Here's the actinotroch larva of a pheronid. These capture food using that big hood over the mouth and also with the tentacles that are sticking out around the ventral and lateral sides of the body. And here is the polydium larva of a nemertian. This larva has a blind ending stomach, which you can see as the compartment with a lot of ciliary action in it on the left side of the screen. Towards the right of the screen, you can see the developing juvenile. It has two big black spots on it. Eventually it will pop out of the larva eat the larval tissue, and go about its life as a juvenile, then adult nemertian. Look at that beautiful apical tuft of cilia. The juvenile is the blob with the two big black dots on it towards the right side of the screen. There were lots of nauplius larvae of two kinds of crustaceans, copepods and barnacles, in the plankton. Here's a copepod nauplius. Anterior is pointing to the top left. You can see three pairs of appendages, which from anterior to posterior are the first antennae, second antennae, and mandibles. Nauplii use these to swim and to feed. Internally, you can see the digestive system. At the anterior end, there's a single eye. Barnacle nauplii are easy to distinguish from copepod nauplii since they always have two anterior horns. They also have a single anterior eye. They have the same set of three pairs of appendages as copepods, but in this individual they look a little more complicated since the second antennae are biramus, that is, each second antenna has two big branches. Here's a dorsal view of the same larva. These barnacle nauplii spend time in the plankton feeding and then metamorphose, but they metamorphose into a second larval stage, the cyprid. Here's a cyprid. These are non-feeding. They have a brief planktonic period during which they look for a good place to settle and metamorphose. Finally, there's always something new that I can't identify in the plankton. I think that this is a sponge larva, for example, but I'm not sure. It's uniformly ciliated, except for that trailing end, which looks like it has no cilia at all. Sponge is my best guess. I also found this thing in the plankton toe. I have no idea what it is. It's ciliated, which suggests that it's a larva to me, but I have no clue what phylum it might belong to. Might also be something completely different, of course, a fragment of some larger animal, for example. I don't even have a guess for this one.